The Harlan County wards were a huge struggle for the Ross and the miners who were recovering from the tragedy of the Great Depression. This could have been just one miserable story just out of many others. However, this became a national triumph for the workers and their union that were able to ultimately win the fight for better wages and the improvement of their working conditions. Harlan County is a small slice of southeastern Kentucky built on the coal industry. Coal miners have their rights and fair wages. This wasn't always the situation. In 1929, Harlan County's coal industry was booming, producing three times as much coal as other counties in Kentucky. Coal miners were able to live comfortable middle-class lifestyles until February of 1931. The coal company during the Great Depression started to sell below cost. In all efforts to prevent money loss, the Harlan County Coal Operators Association cut all miners' wages by 10%. Along with the wage cut, the miners had to deal with horrible working conditions and could barely provide enough for their families. When this happened, the United Mine Workers of America came to their aid. This union came to help the miners organize a strike. When the coal companies heard about this, they began to fire and evict union miners and their families from the company-owned homes. The UMWA helped organize 3,000 men who would rather strike than starve than work and starve. They held meetings while minor operators continued punishing union men or sympathizers. The miners began marching in protest to each mine. Sheriff J. H. Blair brought in reinforcements from neighboring counties, mine guards as special deputies, as well as bringing in heavily armed cars. They began to bully the coal miners. In April, the violence started to escalate quickly between the miners and the deputies. The first death happened. The miners burnt vacant company homes and looted their stores. 5,800 miners were without work, while 900 continued to work. The men who continued to work were called scabs. On May 5th, the miners formed a picket line to march towards Black Mountain Mine. Deputy Sheriff Jim Daniels and his men drove through Everett with them pointing guns. They had machine guns, sawed off shotguns, and rifles. The miners were prepared by hiding in the bushes. Nobody knew who fired first, but the aftermath was three company men and one miner dead. This led to a complete shutdown in Everett's. Coal companies, schools, and stores. <laughs> When the National Guard came in, the miners thought they were being protected. However, this wasn't the case. The National Guard ended up breaking their picket lines and tear gas the miners. Their sheriff stopped their right to assemble, causing the numbers in the Union to plummet. Although the mines were back open and the UMWA failed, the National Miners Union came to Harlem. The NMU opened up soup kitchens in the county. Local labor organizers denounced the organization, the Red Cross and local charities. This caused financial troubles and the closing of its soup kitchens. The National Industrial Recovery Act of 1932 allowed the outlaw of discrimination against union membership and their right to organize. This allowed the mines to run as open shops. Open shops are where employees allow unions but do not have the mandate yet. The NIRA had a little impact in Harlem. Harlem was still in chaos. In 1934, Theodore Middleton defeated J.H. Blair in the re-election. He promised miners he would rid the sheriff's office of bias and to provide protection to union members and representatives. Middleton went back on these promises. 
He gained five months and formed an alliance with an anti-Union County judge. In May 1935, the NRA was deemed unconstitutional. In July 1935, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the Wagner Act. This allowed collective bargaining and the right to organize. It also prohibited five unfair labor practices by employers, like interfering, restraining, or convicting employers against their rights. They were not allowed to fire minors for being in unions. They were not allowed to discriminate against employers who filed charges or testified. When the Wagner Act passed, the mine operators of Harlan did not abide. When miners started celebrating the passage of the bill, the sheriff called in more of his deputies. The deputies beat several miners and scattered the crowd. The violence ensured bombing organizers' cars and shooting in their homes. On February 9, 1937, Sheriff Middleton and his deputies pushed the envelope. They shot in the house of Marshall Music, the minister and union organizer. His 15-year-old son was killed while doing his homework. This stunned the nation, causing the U.S. Senate Committee on Education and Labor to become involved. The U.S. Department of Justice prosecuted 69 mine operators and law officers for ignoring the Wagner Act. U.S. Attorney General Robert H. Jackson interest peaked, and he sent 20 FBI agents to investigate. They discovered enough evidence to send out federal criminal indictments to 22 companies, 24 operators, Sheriff Middleton, and 22 of his deputies. Most of the trials ended with hung juries or dismissing charges completely. The mine owners seen the federal government meant business and would go beyond to support organized labor. Operators began signing union contracts and union memberships rose. In 1938, Kentucky passed a law to not allow a private mine guard system. This made all Harlan mines do away with the gun thugs. For the miners of Eastern Kentucky, the decades-long struggle for representation and acknowledgement other basic human rights were hard won and came at a bitter price, living both figuratively and literally blood on the coal. Coal mining once provided a middle class living. Mine workers in Harlem won living wages and benefits following a series of strikes and violent clashes with scabs and mine owners in the 1930s that earned the county the nickname Bloody Harlem. <laughs>